Good day. This is Speak On It. A part of the Ritual Current Team Who series dealing with not only the upcoming election on November the 3rd, but also dropping a little awareness as it relates to the West Side Heron Opioid Task Force. A task force created a couple of years ago, 2018, I think it was, by LaShawn Ford in his district, the 8th district, which is basically over in Austin, Garfield area on the west side, because of the epidemic of heroin opioid overdose. So State Rep. LaShawn Ford pulled together many partners groups in his area that was working in the field of substance, recovery, so forth. And out of that came the West Side Heron Opioid Task Force. We will look at a piece tonight where the FBI seized $86 million worth of cocaine down there in South Florida. You say, what's that got to do with Chicago? Anybody that asks me those type of questions, you need to go slap yourself. Dope travels. Overdoses travel. So when you want to try to put boundaries on where information comes from, that's because you got a limited mind. We have to go across the world to deal with saving our people in our community. $86 million helped me understand coming out of Florida, it helps me understand what's happening in the black community where other people that are related to those type of people that can get that type of dope into this country because they ran across the border. The cartels can support and supply the necessary funds to buy up these communities that black folks have been ripped off and cheated out of by the political system. So all of it is related. And the reason so many black people are overdosing on dope, opioids, heroin, and other substance is because of the pressure and the pain of being victimized by the system that allows that type of dope to come in here. They caught that. But what about the other $86 million they got in at other spots? So of course they can sit here and everybody can be on top of the Negro and say we lazy and we sorry and we ain't that. <laughs> I guess who's next to Nigeria and we could get some of whatever they got going over there. We could do the same thing as other people over here. That's a real, that's a real significant bus. But they wasn't getting that all out of one bus. That is accumulation of stuff that they had stockpiled and now they are loading. It's quite obvious we starting with that one. I was going, I was going to bring it somewhere else, but hell, what the hell? We'll just deal with it because here it is. What this is accumulation of dope that they have been able to seize up until now. You understand? So when Omari showed you that picture, I won't have to talk about it because I've already said what I had to say about it. But sometimes people be saying, "Man, don't, don't, don't woo woo with me, don't," because dope is not just in one place. Dope come from other places and people OD in your space. And then they travel and OD somewhere else. So when we begin to understand that part of the reason we are in the condition we are in, and that's why I salute LaShawn Ford, I, I think he got enough understanding to understand. You might say West Side, but the West Side ain't just Chicago. The West Side is any side where there are black people. And others, ODN on substance. I'm through with all of that. Now, let you go to this picture here, Amara. Let you see this picture. Now, this is another picture from Kenya. Thanks to Amara, who is the director of this show. Now, Amara brought this picture here. He didn't say how to use it. The other picture you see, he didn't say how to use it. He said, you know, you might want to look at these. You know, I, I saw people out. 
He don't try to, he don't tell you nothing. He is, you know, that was it. But yo, here it is now. Today. It's so perfect. How did Omari know the day was coming? Hmm? Because Negroes are just like these cows. In this part of Kenya, these are cow cowsmen. These people, lifestyles, these tribes herd cows. That's their commerce, that's their business, that's their life. So the Negro right now in this season of America is the cow for the Democratic Party. That's what they are. The Negro are being herded not by herdsmen, but by the herdsmen's dogs. The sheep dogs. The cow dogs. I know when I was a boy, down in East Texas, I don't know how in the hell my granddad and them could have an English bulldog. But back in that day, bulldogs was heavy down in the country. I don't know how. As much as they cost now, $45,000, I don't know how we had them. But we had cows, we had bulls. They sitting that bulldog got that little bit of a bulldog. He grabbed that bull in the in the, in his nose, and that bulldog would deal with him until he broke him down. And that's what the Democrats have done to the Negro: broke you down. And now you just like a herd of cows all over the state. Over 49 million Americans have already voted. I voted too. That's why I didn't look at the debate last night. I'm tired of both of them. But what you need to understand: they were the only two running for president. So don't be asking me who I voted for. None of your damn business. It wasn't just them two. I voted. And that's what you need to go do. But I hear people talking about, yeah, I voted. They so happy. And I'm so glad to see them so happy. But they had a cow. Got the mind of a cow. Just following the herd. But even the herdsmen, these, these great African chiefs and leaders and tribal leaders, they out there herding their own. But they got little democratic operatives in the Negro community. Supposed to be the dog, the bark, and people like I Q supposed to bow down. Supposed to turn over and do tricks. And particularly, God help me. I don't want to get caught up in this. Somebody I knew last night. Say Malik, woo woo, you, you what they said about the women? I ain't said a damn thing about the women that ain't true. If you think I'm lying, listen to this. Let's go with this piece about these women tomorrow. I'm not here to fight about what he did, what he didn't do. Is he a good white man? Is he a bad white man? To me, they pretty much all the same. So I now, I don't agree with that. With that said, I, well, I don't well, agree I, with I, that. I, I, I got to ask this question. I got to ask this question because you're on this show with, with the cocktails with the queen. And there's a cocktails with the queen. Hold oh, that right there, Amari. Do not defend Donald Trump. The audacity. Do you see how they snap? What's in this so just, I have to interrupt this. Cocktails with the queens. <laughs> yeah, okay. You know, that's what you think. But as soon as the man start talking about white folk, all of these crackling hens start doing what? Disagreeing. Herd. That was a herd mentality. All of them at the same time moved in on the black man and start pecking him because he said white man. I don't agree that that. You a little 25 year old, you ain't no queen. How in the hell are you a queen and you ain't got no man? You go slap yourself. You have to have a man to be a queen. You have to have a king. Little, 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 little run in your mouth. Cocktails. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You need a cock to deal with your tail. Continue, brother. With that said, oh, yeah. well, I don't well, agree I, with I, that. I, 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 I gotta ask this question. I gotta ask this question because you're on this show with with the cocktails with the queens, and there's a reason for that. It wasn't to have you defend or not defend Donald Trump. It was about I care about what's in this contract with Black America for women, and and it's not we're not mentioned at all in the contract with Black America. And I you are mentioned. I mean, when you when you mention black people, you mention them black women. So oh, don't count yourself no, out. No, yes, that's you not true. Just like, the, just like administration said that when they black mention, people are not black, black women. Black, 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 black women are not included in black people. No, I told you you can write that up. If you but we, we, it's not our, we're not out here jumping. 
dropping on calls. We all, in the, we all black, so we all. Oh, we're not. Together. We're not meeting up with Jared Kushner and Donald Trump about this. You are. So we, you can't say, well, if you don't okay. like it, add to it. You're out here. You took that job. You took that position. I, I, to I'll write this it book. up. So like, I'll, don't I'll say write up, you. I'll write up the black woman's part of the contract for you. How many words do y'all want it to be? The thing is, you guys are the experts, but here we go again. You just want to talk. Nobody want to help me. Just want to talk. But y'all are the experts on black women, so why won't y'all help me? See, that's the problem. That's I, not, I, I can tell you why. You just let me party. So, <laughs> anyway, now, the initiatives have already been set. <laughs> All right, I'm all right. Let's go to something else. See, let, let, let me tell y'all something. You know what? See, part of the problem with the Negro is that the black woman, she been tricked by the white man, her master. He's always been her master. You know what I'm saying? And she's always ask this woman that's running for vice president. Ask her who her master is. Clearly. But look at Ice Cube family. They're all just like him. Her family. She's the only oddball in the place. But that's the nature. No, all black women ain't like that. But these are these little new generation females. And there's another piece with, with somebody from BLM we had that, but I'm not wasting no time on all that. Where she wanted to tell Ice Cube, you can't jump the line. <laughs> ain't that something? Basically, who are you? I this, I'm that. But you know, Trump, you know, he he, he laid it out in that speech he had in Atlanta. So it's an hour and thirty seven minutes. We can't play it here. I, I wanted to play it on the other venue, but hell, so many callers, I couldn't even play it there. But Trump made it clear. You ought to look at the the mission statement of BLM. So when the woman said to Ice Cube that. She, her, they, females, govern. Govern what? You ain't elected. You ain't over no government. Who are you to say you govern? So they saying to him, dude, stay in your lane. Stay in your place. We are the gatekeepers. We, the crackling hands. <laughs> we have to give you males. They don't even call us men no more. We have to give you males permission. Because we and the white man run this. The elections are determined by the black. I ain't even call you a woman. Female. See? So don't get mad at Ice Cube. And I don't give a damn if you get mad at me. You know what I'm saying? I really don't. But that type of foolishness there. Said it last week. Where it looked like. By 18 to 24 percent of the black men seem to be sort of feeling Trump a little bit, but only six percent. The six percent of the Negroes, are women, that's what they are. They part of the herd. But they don't want to come together with the black man. They want to be over the back black man. They want to compete with the black man. Place of coming together with him. No, you've been programmed to think. So now you in line like a herd of cow or sheep, not for what you can get out of it, but to get somebody out of the spot, Trump. That's a hell of a motivation to go vote. Oh, we got to get him out. We can't stand four more years. Da, 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 da. So you voting to get him out, but you ain't voting to get nothing in that might help you because this devil that you finna put in there. <laughs> What did he do to Obama last night? Threw his little, threw him under the bus. So what do you think he gonna do with you? <laughs> Let's see that piece about Obama. Let them see that headline, brother. They think I'm lying.
I hope you read that. I didn't want to interject. I hope you read it, but you're going to say it's false. You're going to say it's fake news. You are. When I say you, I'm talking to us, man. I'm talking to us, Negroes. I ain't talking to you other people. I'm talking to the Negroes. Go vote. Go do what you got to do. But don't just have a herd mentality, y'all. Now, this dude's showing himself. He, he you know, he, he's showing himself. He's always been what he is. He ain't changed. First opportunity he got. What did he do? He let, he let, he let them white folks know. He let them Hispanics know. That was, the, that, 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 that was the president. That wasn't me. Last week when we had him on here asking him about reparations of black folks, he keeps talking about immigrants in Native America. He never did mention black people. Never did he mention or acknowledge the question that the man asked him. Never. He started talking about Hispanic children. Da, 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 da. So you see what he's doing. Then he sent uh, that woman Harris down there to Florida to try to do something, down there to work with them dope dealers and shit to try to get up on some things, you know what I'm saying? But he ain't sent her nowhere in the black community to try to get no black nothing. So don't play with me. You understand that? Because you need to open your eyes. You need to open your ears. We used to be able to play the song, by by the Gospel Clips. Father, open our eyes. Can't do that now because YouTube and all them little places, they done got so sensitive now for with Negroes like me. They don't want a Negro to get a message out. They want a Negro to just be stupid. Be there, be, be these old stupid rappers and killers and, 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 and confused people. But when you try to get that message out, Father, open our eyes so we can see. Yeah, many of us came from East Africa, comparatively speaking. And many of us were Calvin. We were. Many of us were people that understood nature. And we understood the herd mentality. But the Democratic Party is using it against y'all. And I ain't advocating for the Republican Party. But I'm just looking at how you are a herd that said, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Can't stand Trump. Can't, okay, don't stand him. I told you what should have happened. Trump, God gave Trump a way out and Trump keep talking about God. Man, I wish I would have... Gave with Margaret. That I don't guess we get to do it. Keep talking about God. But the truth of the matter is, God gave him a way out. He, 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 told, he, he allowed him to say he had COVID-19. All Trump had to do was just lay there, ask for a ventilator, read him some books, and say, look here, I ain't running no more. I got COVID. And when the election was over, get up and walk on out like you're doing now. They would have talked about it for two days. He'd have been out of there. Then he could have went and fought his case. But no, but but what happened? Trump, Trump just a, just a character. Trump decided to get up, come back out there, and start this foolishness all over again. So that's on him. So I ain't advocating for Trump. I ain't advocating for the Republicans. But I am. I am dead going to show making it clear to the best of my little resources. That the herd mentality is not the way you get things done that's going to benefit you. All right, brother, let's move on. Let's look at this piece. Here. This, moment is, this is a this is an interesting piece you're fitting here right now. You ain't going to hear all of this. But just hear a piece of it because your boy, once again. Maybe shocking, maybe history-altering development just a few moments ago. We received a statement. We aired a statement from a former naval officer called Tony Bobolinsky. Bobolinsky was a business partner of Hunter Biden's. That's probably a name you've never heard before today. You're going to hear a lot about this man in the coming days. So let's get a few things straight. There's no evidence, we have no evidence as of tonight, that Bobolinsky is a partisan Republican. In fact, Republican. In fact, all the evidence suggests otherwise. He is a registered Democrat. All of his political donations have been to Democrats. Tonight, Bobolinsky announced that he met directly with Joe Biden and discussed the Biden family's business dealings with the communist government of China. He says he has text messages that corroborate that, and apparently he does. Here's part of the on-camera statement from Tony Bobolinsky just a few moments ago. I have heard Joe Biden say that he's never discussed business with Hunter. That is false. I have firsthand knowledge about this because I directly dealt with the Biden family including Joe Biden. I brought, I guess, for record, three phones that spanned 
the years 2015 through 2018. These phones have never been held by anybody else besides myself. I was introduced to Joe Biden by Jim Biden and Hunter Biden. At, approx and a, at my approximately hour-long meeting with Joe that night, we discussed the Biden's history, the Biden's family business plans with the Chinese, with which he was plainly familiar, at least at a high level. I received an email concerning allocation of equity, which says 10% held by H for the big guy. In that email, there's no question that H stands for Hunter, big guy for his father, Joe Biden. I will be providing to the FBI the devices which contain the evidence corroborating what I have said. All coming so fast, an awful lot of detail. In a written statement, Bobulinski added this, by the way, Hunter Biden, he said, frequently referred to his father as, quote, my chairman. Hunter Biden, quote, frequently referenced asking his father for his sign-off or advice in various potential deals that we were discussing. That would be with the communist government of China. As of right now, 8.03 Eastern Time, the Biden campaign has not directly denied this. Now, keep in mind, this topic, amazingly, may not come up in the debate tonight. The final presidential debate traditionally centers on questions of foreign policy, but the rules have been changed. You can guess as to why. And now the announced topics, among others, will be coronavirus and climate change. So none of this may be addressed directly tonight. The president, of course, is aware of that. No doubt plans to ask questions directly to the former vice president on the stage. But the debate commission has thought this through, and they've announced that if the president speaks out of turn, his microphone will be cut off. He will be standing there gesticulating like a mime in silence. But that won't make the questions themselves go away. And for the next week and a half, you are likely to hear them again and again. And the central question in all of this is did Joe Biden himself profit from these deals? And there's no question at this point that there were deals. Remember last week, the New York Post published an email dated May 13th, 2017. It was retrieved from Hunter Biden's laptop, and it was his laptop. In that email, an associate discusses setting aside a, quote, 10% equity stake in a Chinese company. That company, CEFC, that money would be reserved for someone referred to as the big guy. Now, that email is real. Fox News has confirmed it's authentic. And again, no one on the Biden campaign has disputed its authenticity. In his statement, Bobby Linsky didn't just confirm that the May 13th, 2017 email is real. He also explained, as you might have already guessed, that Joe Biden is, in fact, the big guy referenced in the document. And he would know. Bobby Linsky was the CEO of something called Sinohawk Holdings. So it was a partnership between CEFC and the Biden family. From the outset, Bobby Lindsay All right, we can cut it. What I wanted to do is hold on, because he's going to mention this Harris woman. Y'all thought that, you know, it just was by coincidence that uh, she became Biden's running mate. She and that. Yeah. If you go on and you listen to that whole thing, you will uh, hear her name. That's what I said. You will hear her name. So you got these two, and here they are. You know, you got, you know, you got it, it is what it is. And there it is. But I can't waste the whole show dealing with that. I just wanted to put a little something, something out there for you. Because that's what Speak On It is about. Oh, by the way, before I forget, Omar, tonight, October the 23rd, Friday, around 6 o'clock, you need to turn in to Channel 19 because Eugene Matthews will be hosting a live show, keeping it 100. And he and I will be doing just that, keeping it 100. Now, it won't be like these shows, because that's Eugene Matthews' show. But I truly suggest that if you got something to say about it, some things, that the night you call here at KNTV around 6 o'clock, we'll be going live. And Eugene Matthews will definitely be keeping it 100, because he's going to be on <laughs> He handles Trump different than I do. So you all gonna love that because he gonna, he gonna give you something to really be licking your gums for. But let's go on to something else, man. At this moment, the most compelling voice against abortion and Planned Parenthood is not a Republican. The most widely heard Christian evangelist in America is not ordained. 
Instead, he is a rapper married to a Kardashian, who, by the way, everyone says is crazy. Kanye West is running for president, but that's not really the headline. The headline is that on core conservative issues, not political issues like legislation before the Congress, but on foundational questions about life and children and what happens when you die, no one with a national platform has been more honest or sincere or effective than Kanye West has been, maybe in generations. It's all pretty shocking, really. Talk about an unlikely messenger. But it's real. Check out West's Twitter feed if you haven't seen it. Not everything he says is conservative, far from it. Not everything he says is even intelligible. But when West talks about his faith and about the gift of human life, you start to ask yourself, why aren't there any elected Republicans who sound like that? They say they believe the same things, but if they actually do, why don't they talk like Kanye West does? And the answer, of course, is because they're afraid to. But West is not afraid. He doesn't have to be. He's too famous. He's made too much money. He sold something like 150 million albums over the past 20 years. And really, it's hard to cancel a guy like that. So what does the left do in response to Kanye West? How do you make Kanye West shut up? The short answer is you can't, so you work to discredit him. You go ad hominem. You ignore what he's saying. You attack him as a person. You don't engage with his ideas. You know you would lose if you tried that. So instead, you try to keep people from listening to him. It's an easier job when you're dealing with less famous people. Thanks to our centrally controlled internet, the left can usually silence dissent in an instant with the press of a button. But with prominent wrong thinkers like Kanye West, censorship requires a finer touch, more artistic flair. When the author J.K. Rowling had the gall to note that biological sex is a physical reality, not just a state of mind, Google couldn't simply wipe her off the internet. She's J.K. Rowling. She created Harry Potter. So the left had to destroy her more methodically. One British news site compared Rowling to the anti-Semite Richard Wagner and then dismissed her as, quote, deeply unpleasant. So multiply that attack by hundreds of stories, and over time they are confident, and maybe they're right, that no one will ever listen to J.K. Rowling again. In Kanye West's case, they decided to attack him as mentally ill. You hear that a lot now, but it's a relatively new tactic. It was just a little over four years ago that CNN published a piece about Kanye West. They highlighted his most famous moments, like the time he interrupted Taylor Swift at the MTV Video Music Awards. CNN described all these incidents as, quote, controversial. But there was no mention of Kanye West being a danger to himself, much less mentally ill. No, just controversial. Not a problem. And then West appeared to say something positive about Donald Trump, and everything changed in an instant. Kanye West became a babbling lunatic, the kind of guy who pulls imaginary insects out of the air and soils his own pants. A total nutcase. Watch. Kanye West's um, event on Sunday, and, and you saw, right. um, at, at least I saw a man clearly in trouble. We met David Bowen, a Democratic state representative, earlier this summer. Bowen telling CNN, it's sad to see a popular music artist like Kanye be used as a pawn to trick his own people and fans. So new questions this morning about Kanye West's mental health after this tweet storm and so-called campaign rally. You see that, that ignorance and asinine uh, thought and behavior um, it has been something that's risen to the top. Whether a clearly vulnerable Mr. West is being used to try to siphon votes away from Joe Biden. They're sad. They're concerned. He's in trouble. Oh, it's all so fake. The feigned concern, the oily fake empathy. Kanye is vulnerable, right? These people are actually worried, but they're not worried about Kanye West or his family. They don't care about them. They're worried about the threat that West poses to Democratic Party orthodoxy and therefore to their power. They don't say that out loud. They're liars. So instead, they continue to play the role of psychiatric nurse. Here's the guy whose job it is to get drunk on camera on New Year's Eve, letting Kanye West know that he's embarrassing himself and his dead mother. What I saw was a minstrel show today. Him in front of all of these white people, mostly white people, embarrassing himself and embarrassing Americans, but mostly African Americans. And now all of a sudden, he is the person who represents the African American community. He doesn't. This was an embarrassment. Kanye's mother is rolling over in her grave. He's yeah, we're going to leave it there. You, you, you get the flavor. 
Once well, again, should this group of you see, they use these little, 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 little so-called gatekeeper, and that that name sounds a little more pleasant to me than all that other negative stuff people used to use. But now we're gonna go back and listen to Malcolm X back in the '60s. You see how them white folk see how y'all talk about fake news? See how they, you know, do they look like racists? You see, they, they ain't got no problem being bent down there, little almost like they're on their knees talking to Malcolm X. That's before y'all programmed the herd mentality that all white folks were just fixated on, on, on racism and, race and, and, and white supremacy. Listen to this. I spoke about the brotherhood that existed at all levels and among all people who were there on that hodge who had accepted the religion of Islam. And I pointed out that uh, for what it had done, what the religion of Islam had done for those people over there, despite their complexion differences, that it would probably uh, do America well to study the religion of Islam and perhaps it could drive some of, some of the racism from this society as it has driven racism from the Muslim society. You accept immigration as a possible solution to the racial problem in this country? No, in, see, uh, people cloud the issue when they bring in the word integration. Integration can't even be defined. This is one of the reasons why it hasn't been realized. Uh, it's not a problem of integration or, or, or separation. It's a problem of uh, human rights. Uh, it's a problem of recognizing and respecting the 22 million Afro-Americans as human beings. Now, whatever is done to uh, bring about the complete recognition and respect of the Afro-Americans as human beings, uh, human rights are respected, then you're working toward a solution. You think the current integration drive is aiming for this goal? Well, I, don't, I can't say that the current integration drive is aiming for that goal because it hasn't realized the goal in any state. They haven't even got integration right here in New York City. You have worse integration problems in the North than they have in the South. So if it doesn't work, in, if, if you can't bring about integration in New York City as international, cosmopolitan, up-to-date as it's supposed to be, you will never get integration anywhere else in the country. Malcolm, have your experiences with uh, white-skinned Muslims in uh, Africa and the Middle East made you feel that uh, relations between Negroes and whites who are not Muslims is any more possible? Uh, when I was in, on the pilgrimage, I had close contact with Muslims whose skin would in America be classified as white and with Muslims who themselves would be classified as white in America. But these particular Muslims didn't call themselves white. They looked upon themselves as human beings, as part of the human family, and therefore they looked upon all other segments of the human family as part of that same family. Well, now, uh, they had a different look or a different air or a different attitude than that which is uh, reflected in the uh, attitude of the man in America who calls himself white. So I said that if uh, Islam had done, this, done that for them, Perhaps if the white man in America would study Islam, perhaps it could do the same thing for him. I think what a lot of people are interested in, Malcolm, is whether this experience has made you feel that, that your feelings have changed, that, uh, that the animosity you have expressed in the past toward all fights. And there's one thing that I want to make cl clear. No matter how much respect, no matter how much uh, uh, recognition, white show toward me, as far as I'm concerned, as long as that same respect and recognition is not shown toward every one of our people in this country, it doesn't exist for me. <laughs> now, I'm just are you prepared to go into the United Nations at this point and ask that charges be brought against the United States for its treatment of American Negroes? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yeah, true. The audience will have to be quiet. <laughs> uh, yes, the, as I pointed out when I was in, during my travel, that nations look, African nations and Asian nations and Latin American nations look very hypocritical when they stand up in the United Nations condemning the racist practices of South Africa and that which is practiced by Portugal and Angola and saying nothing in the UN about the racist practices uh, that are, that are uh, manifest every day against Negroes in this society. Even in South Africa, those Africans uh, aren't faced with bayonets and aren't faced with police dogs. And I, when I was in Beirut, I saw a picture on the front page 
of a Negro being beaten in Tennessee on the front page of the paper in Beirut. When I got to Cairo, I saw the same picture of a Negro being beaten in Tennessee. When I got to Lagos, I saw the same picture. So uh, with these African nations knowing the brutality that is inflicted upon black people in this country, simply because those black people are trying to get what the Supreme Court said they were supposed to have 10 years ago, I, I would be not a man. If I was in a position to bring it in front of the United Nations and didn't do so, I wouldn't be a man. Malcolm, do you intend to lead the charge uh, in the United Nations? Well, I, I find that to say you're going to lead something creates a lot of hostility, division, jealousy, and envy. Uh, I hope to, to work with any group of leaders or any group of organizations to do whatever is necessary to see if this problem is brought before the United Nations. Have you had any commitments from any nations in Africa to support you? I, will, I would rather not say at this time. But one thing I found in my travels, all of them look at, upon us as their long-lost brother. You realize the implication is that you have had such commitments when you say it. This is right. your interpretation of what I said. <laughs> uh, 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 one thing that I found in all of my travels was that uh, all of the Africans, not only the Africans, but the Asians and the Muslims, look upon us as their long-lost brothers. And America had actually tricked... All right, Amari, we can go on. They, 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 they get the flavor. But one of the things I, I, I want to ask you, Amari, and I know y'all say, well, why don't you... No. While I was looking here, and he told me, Amari told me when we started, he said, just, just, you know, you can just do it, take your time. But I got to say this, and Amari, if you hear me out there, that piece with Kanye West, you know, if you can find that piece and start where you cut off. And let me tell you why. Not right now. I mean, before the show is out. One of the reasons I chose that piece by Kanye West, because he said he running in 2024. And had he been on the ballot in Illinois, I would have voted for him this year. Just in case I ain't here four years from now. So, you know, there's a lot in there. But one of the things he said is that the number one killer of black people is abortion. Over 90 million black babies are killed. I don't want to say a year, but I'm almost saying, I'm almost, I'm telling you, man. I'm hoping he said in the last so many years. So if not, that's a piece you all should find because that was the point. The point was you, what's his name, uh, Biden, they want to kill a baby at, 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 at eight or nine months if he's in the belly. He don't give a damn. Just just kill him. And that woman that created that Planned Parenthood, those are things that are still in that cut. And those things are important, but I'm, I'm just so caught up on this time thing until I'm leaving out some real good stuff. But what you need to understand is that the number of black babies aborted That is the biggest threat to us. But all of you new breed people, and I, I believe in a woman's right, but I want to deal with those that used to believe in the old time religion. You understand? That used to believe that a child had a right to be born, and Kanye was going to be crying tears and talking about that in that piece. So, Amari, if you can find it, we're going to go back to that at the end. We don't have to deal with it right now. Let's just continue and beat out this clock, and maybe we have a couple of minutes left. Sail on, sail on until the flag of the red, the black, and the green is perched upon the hills of the Africa. Because the time has come for the black man to forget his hero worship of other races and to create and emulate heroes of his own. We must canonize our own saints, create our own martyrs, and elevate the positions of fame and honor black men and women who have made a distinct contribution to our racial history. Sojourner Truth is worthy of a place of sainthood alongside the Joan of Arc. Christmas Harris and George William Garden are entitled to the halo of martyrdom with no less glory than the martyrs of any other race. To St. Levitor's brilliancy as a soldier or a statesman outshone that of any other people, hence he's entitled to the highest place as a hero among men. Because Africa created millions and countless millions of black men and women in war and peace, whose luster and bravery outshone that of any, any other people. So why not see good and perfection in ourselves? Now, that was Marcus Garvey, y'all. Now we finna hear, we heard from Malcolm, we heard from Marcus. Now we finna hear from Dr. King. In New York City, 
It was a dark Saturday afternoon. The minute black woman came up, the only question I heard from her was, Are you Martin Luther King? And I said, yes. The next minute I felt something beating on my chest. Before I knew it, I had been stabbed by this demented woman. That blade had gone through and the x-rays revealed. The tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta, the main artery. And once that's punctured, you drowned in your own blood, that's the end of it. It came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had merely sneezed, I would have died. After my chest had been opened and the blade had been taken out from all over the states and the world, kind letters came in. One of them I will never forget. I had received one from the president and the vice president. I've forgotten what those telegrams said. I received a visit and a letter from the governor of New York, but I've forgotten what that letter said. But there was another letter that came from a little girl. Said simply, Dear Dr. King, while it should not matter, I would like to mention that I'm a white girl. I'm simply writing you to say that I'm so happy that you didn't sneeze. And I want to say tonight, I want to say tonight that I too am happy that I didn't sneeze because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960 when students all over the South started sitting in at lunch counters. And I knew that as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best in the American dream and taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution if I had sneezed. I wouldn't have been around here in 1961 when we decided to take a ride for freedom and ended segregation in interstate travel. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1962 when Negroes in Albany, Georgia decided to straighten their backs up. And whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they are going somewhere because a man can't ride your back unless it is bent. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been here in 1963. Black people of Birmingham, Alabama, aroused the conscience of this nation and brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had a chance later that year in August to try to tell America about a dream that I had had. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been down in Selma, Alabama to see the great movement there. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been in Memphis to see a community rally around those brothers and sisters who are suffering. I'm so happy that I didn't sneeze. Like anybody, I would like to live. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Let us rise up tonight. Yeah, we going to that one. I mean, I, I want people to get the spirit. This is a powerful time in time with this election. So I want Malcolm, Marcus, Martin, I want these people, spirit to be risen and to help these Negroes wake up. I'm tired of marching tired of marching for something that should have been mine at birth. I don't mind saying to you tonight. I don't mind saying to you tonight 
that I'm tired of the tension surrounding our days. I don't mind saying to you tonight that I'm tired of living every day under the threat of death. I have no martyr complex. I want to live as long as anybody in this building tonight. And sometimes I begin to doubt whether I'm going to make it through. I must confess I'm tired. Well, that was that. And part of, you know, part of the, the hope that I've discussed with those that help deal with this presentation is that we at least stimulate some type of thought other than hate. And that's why we bring it like we bring it. And I think that, you know, people just need to pay attention. November the 3rd will be here in a minute. And I don't think going out to vote is a problem. I think, I think there's going to be more than sufficient votes for whoever you want. But at the end of the day, we don't know how they're going to make the decision of who become the president. That's the reality, because we have seen them before. The person with the most votes don't become president all the time. So you still got to have your mind clear. Otherwise, you start doing something stupid again. You start talking about race wars. We've been there, done that. You start talking about civil wars. We've been there, done that. You start talking about a whole lot of things, Negro, that you need to just, just stop getting off in the foolishness. It's foolish when you go burn down the community stores in the area you live. That's foolish. So I just want to put this information out here because you all voting to get Trump out as if Trump did all of that. But you don't want to talk about all of what Biden has done in the 47 years he's been in office. And all of them black folks that he's created a path to be incarcerated for the rest of their lives for little bitty dope cases with his 1994 crime bill. I'm going to leave it alone. Brother, we know how to deal with this here. I, I said what I had to say about this money. I mean, they don't need to deal with it. Bypass this one here, and uh, and and if, and if you can, why you running this? Whatever, you know. Let's try to get back that Kanye West. If there's any way possible to do that, I would rather see that than to hear the Ice Cube. What they talking about? I don't care. What I'm concerned about at this point is that black people's here about this Kanye West. That piece about them that going abortion, abortion boy. and Planned Parenthood is not a Republican. The most widely heard Christian evangelist in America is not ordained. Instead, he is a rapper married to a Kardashian, who, by the way, everyone says is crazy. Kanye West is running for president, but that's not really the headline. The headline is that on core conservative issues, not political issues like legislation before the Congress, but on foundational questions about life and children and what happens when you die, no one with a national platform has been more honest or sincere or effective than Kanye West has been, maybe in generations. It's all pretty shocking, really. Talk about an unlikely messenger. But it's real. Check out West's Twitter feed if you haven't seen it. Not everything he says is conservative, far from it. Not everything he says is even intelligible. But when West talks about his faith and about the gift of human life, you start to ask yourself, why aren't there any elected Republicans who sound like that? They say they believe the same things, but if they actually do, why don't they talk like Kanye West does? And the answer, of course, is because they're afraid to. But West is not afraid. He doesn't have to be. He's too famous. He's made too much money. He sold something like 150 million albums over the past 20 years. And really, it's hard to cancel a guy like that. So what does the left do in response to Kanye West? How do you make Kanye West shut up? The short answer is you can't, so you work to discredit him. You go ad hominem. You ignore what he's saying. You attack him as a person. You don't engage with his ideas. You know you would lose if you tried that. So instead, you try to keep people from listening to him. 
It's an easier job when you're dealing with less famous people. Thanks to our centrally controlled internet, the left can usually silence dissent in an instant with the press of a button. But with prominent wrong thinkers like Kanye West, censorship requires a finer touch, more artistic flair. When the author J.K. Rowling had the gall to note that biological sex is a physical reality, not just a state of mind, Google couldn't simply wipe her off the internet. She's J.K. Rowling. She created Harry Potter. So the left had to destroy her more methodically. One British news site compared Rowling to the anti-Semite Richard Wagner and then dismissed her as, quote, deeply unpleasant. So multiply that attack by hundreds of stories, and over time they are confident, and maybe they're right, that no one will ever listen to J.K. Rowling again. In Kanye West's case, they decided to attack him as mentally ill. You hear that a lot now, but it's a relatively new tactic. It was just a little over four years ago that CNN published a piece about Kanye West. They highlighted his most famous moments, like the time he interrupted Taylor Swift at the MTV Video Music Awards. CNN described all these incidents as, quote, controversial. But there was no mention of Kanye West being a danger to himself, much less mentally ill. No, just controversial. Not a problem. And then West appeared to say something positive about Donald Trump, and everything changed in an instant. Kanye West became a babbling lunatic, the kind of guy who pulls imaginary insects out of the air and soils his own pants. A total nutcase. Watch. Kanye West's um, event on Sunday, and, and you saw, right. um, at, at least I saw a man clearly in trouble. We met David Bowen, a Democratic state representative, earlier this summer. Bowen telling CNN, it's sad to see a popular music artist like Kanye be used as a pawn to trick his own people and fans. So new questions this morning about Kanye West's mental health after this tweet storm and so-called campaign rally. You see that, that ignorance and asinine uh, thought and behavior um, it has been something that's risen to the top. Whether a clearly vulnerable Mr. West is being used to try to siphon votes away from Joe Biden. They're sad. They're concerned. He's in trouble. Oh, it's all so fake. The feigned concern, the oily fake empathy. Kanye is vulnerable, right? These people are actually worried, but they're not worried about Kanye West or his family. They don't care about them. They're worried about the threat that West poses to Democratic Party orthodoxy and therefore to their power. They don't say that out loud. They're liars. So instead, they continue to play the role of psychiatric nurse. Here's the guy whose job it is to get drunk on camera on New Year's Eve, letting Kanye West know that he's embarrassing himself and his dead mother. What I saw was a minstrel show today. Him in front of all of these white people, mostly white people, embarrassing himself and embarrassing Americans, but mostly African Americans. And now all of a sudden, he is the person who represents the African American community. He doesn't. This was an embarrassment. Kanye's mother is rolling over in her grave. He's defiling the memory of his mother. Sad. You'll notice that this group of cable news mental health experts may be deeply concerned about Kanye West, and yet for all of their apparent medical training, somehow they don't appear to notice that Joe Biden can no longer speak English. Joe's fine. He's not embarrassing anyone. Kanye West, by contrast, is deeply embarrassing to them, mostly because he's embarrassing to the Democratic Party. Here is someone who should be a Democrat calling out the most absurd lie that party tells. We care about black lives. That's why we want more abortion clinics in black neighborhoods. That's their position. It is insultingly stupid, and anyone who thinks about it knows that. When you love your kids, you want them to grow up and have children of their own. It's the main thing you want. But if your most consistent message to your children was, please end your pregnancy, they might start to wonder how you really felt about them. And Kanye West has start to wonder about that and things like that. Last month on Twitter, West wrote that he had, quote, cried at the thought of aborting my firstborn. I'm concerned for the world that feels you shouldn't cry about this subject. That's for sure. It's obvious. But when Kanye West says it, people might actually listen to him. And that's a massive problem for the left. Here he is last month. My mom saved my life. My dad wanted to abort me. My mom saved my life. There would have been no Kanye West because my dad was too busy. Oh, 
time you heard someone famous say something like that in public? Let's see, never. And then Wes went on to point out some of the more inconvenient facts that the progressive left wants you to forget. Quote, over 22,500,000 black babies have been aborted over the past 50 years, Wes tweeted. See, the media said, he's not well. Pray for him. Of course, what Wes said was factually true. What's also true is that Planned Parenthood was founded by someone who wanted fewer black people. That's why she founded Planned Parenthood. Her name was Margaret Sanger, and she once wondered aloud about the appearances of, quote, exterminating the Negro population, end quote. It's disgusting. You can find that on Google. West has. He knows it. And learning it clearly made him rethink his worldview. Here he is from a couple of years ago. One of the moves that I love that liberals tried to do, the liberal would try to control a black person through the concept of racism because they know that we are very proud, emotional people. So when I said I like Trump to like someone that's liberal, they'll say, oh, but he's racist. You think racism can control me? Oh, that don't stop me. That's an invisible wall. <laughs> oh, no wonder they hate him. Now, to be clear, Kanye West is not a normal person. And we're not saying he is. He has said out loud he sometimes suffers from something he calls a sprained brain. We're not sure what that is. We're not pretending to be mental health experts. And maybe Kanye West is crazy. We don't know. But it's also true, and wise people know this, that at a time like this, a lunatic time, sometimes it is only the crazy people who can see the world clearly. Lila Rose founded Live Action this afternoon. YouTube, by the way, censored one of her videos about abortion, not surprisingly, probably because <laughs> it was true. She joins us. Lila, thanks so much for coming on. So you think about this topic for a living. Mm -hmm. You articulate a position against it. And bless you for that, for a living. What do you make of Kanye West saying these things? Yeah, well, he's getting a lot of pushback from a lot of media elites and politicians and those in entertainment because he's saying something that is true and that they refuse to acknowledge or reckon with, which is that abortion is the intentional and direct killing of an innocent human child. And he's expressing grief for the idea that in the past, when he, his then girlfriend was pregnant with his now seven-year-old daughter, that he thought about encouraging an abortion. And that grief is, 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 is real. I think it's a shame for us to accuse it of just being crazy and, and write, write that off. That's real. But people are refusing to acknowledge it. And that's the real problem here, Tucker. There have been 60 million children killed since abortion was legalized in this country. 60 million children, sons and daughters. And there are mothers and fathers who are walking wounded, who have not reckoned with that, who have not grieved that, who have not said sorry for that. And they're still hurting. It's buried deep inside. And until we reckon with it as a culture and we, we fix the law to make this unthinkable and illegal, we're not going to have the national healing that we all, I think, want and the national unity that we all want. We can't go on like this. So I think him saying this is definitely um, infuriating for people and, and they want to just ignore it, pretend it's not happening. But it is a cultural revolution that's happening where people are waking up to the fact that abortion is an atrocity and it needs to stop. There is no upside for him in saying this that I can think of. He's certainly not becoming more popular among the people uh, in his world. Um, I'm, anyway. I'm grateful. I'm, I'm grateful for his voice. I'm grateful that he's using his platform. And he's speaking specifically to the black community. I mean, a black woman is three to five times more likely than a white woman today to have an abortion. There's, there's 19 but, to 22 million children killed by abortion who are black just because of the, you well, know, the, the focus of the abortion industry on, on being in black neighborhoods. And that, if there is institutional racism today more than anything, that's the greatest, the greatest impact of it is the killing. It's the number one cause of death amongst blacks is the killing of children in the womb. If a man and stands up and it. says, my children are the most important thing to me, they're the greatest blessing I have, yeah. and he's denounced as crazy, it tells you who's crazy. It's not him. Yeah, I, I we all say. have something to learn. I think we all have something to learn from him. Yeah, I have. I agree. Yeah. Great to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Tucker. Well, you see, that's why the spirit made me do that. Omar, Jeffrey Epstein wasn't that's more important be. than listening to, to Ice Cube and this other dude talk about whatever. That is what it is. But Negroes needed to hear that piece about abortions because we acting like we, you know, we act like we don't know no better. Negroes, you know, we, we don't, we, we used to didn't do that. 
we it, it wouldn't it's almost unbelievable that 22 million babies have been aborted basically because that's what she chose to do you understand it's my body it's this it's that yeah okay back in the day we would say that 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 life is coming through you is sent to you by God and it could be God himself but it's my body okay I ain't gonna get into that but Kanye West probably would have made a better candidate than either one of them but until next week a lot for you peace and good health